important points. Uh, the outline of my talk is goals of meal planning in type 1 diabetes, carbohydrate counting, synchronization between types of insulin and meals, and protein and fat counting. Now, goals of meal planning in type 1 diabetes, as per these SPAD guidelines, it should be a carbohydrate controlled, so it's, it shouldn't be a low or a no carbohydrate plan, it should be a carbohydrate controlled meal plan, which provides adequate energy and nutrients that promote growth and development, maintains normal glycemia, prevents hypoglycemia, prevention of diabetes, ketoacidosis and complications, and the initial weight loss at time of diagnosis must be restored with adequate energy intake. Very important is to manage hypothyroidism and celiac if present in children with type 1 diabetes. Now, the conventional method, and uh, you know, I started my practice 20 years back, and there we used to, anybody who was to come with insulin prescription, we used to actually plan the diet in such a way that every two to three hours we were giving something to eat, and bedtime snack was compulsory because there was a constant fear of hypoglycemia. So we were feeding for the insulin. But today, with the newer insulins come in the market, it has become very easy, more flexibility, and now we're giving insulin for the food. So if the child eats less, you give less insulin. If the child decides to eat a, a roti extra or eat more rice, you give additional insulin. So a lot of flexibility. Now, if you look at the kind of Indian meals, and a lot of people have snacks as meals. You know, typically when we take dietary calls, we see, uh, you know, the evening meals are typically snacks, especially with our children. It could be uh, you know, a sandwich or a wrap, or it could be a burrito bowl. And therefore, the carbohydrate counts for the meal's weight is. Now, if they take the same amount of insulin for the meal, then either there are chances of going into hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. And therefore, carbohydrate counting comes in the picture. And like Dr. Upal rightly said, I think, you know, we think that people will not understand carb counts, but honestly telling you, each and every person with diabetes, that is a child with diabetes who comes to our clinic, however literate or maybe not so literate we have, they all learn carb counting and they do very well. In fact, they could uh, know the carb counts of all the foods more than maybe, you know, me and other dietitians would know. And this approach definitely increases flexibility by allowing more variability variance in terms of food intake at different meal times, decreases the need for in between snacking and allowing greater flexibility in meal times. However, I think it's very important that we should pay attention to the total energy carbohydrate intake and timings of meals or snack to prevent excessive weight gain. Because typically what happens is on WhatsApp, we get forward, we get messages from our children, sometimes with a muffin, sometimes with a burger, sometimes with a slice of pizza, asking us how much carbs and how much insulin do I need to take. So therefore, it's very, very important to educate about the principles of healthy eating. And I think Shubda has put this very beautifully, that it's important. And I think the plate method is very, very easy and simple to understand. And it is definitely not restrictive. So most of the days, and I always tell them that this, this is the same whether the child has diabetes or the child does not have diabetes. So even if the, if the, if the child has a sibling uh, who does not have diabetes, he also should be encouraged to eat the same food because today we're seeing a lot of children with obesity and also with type 2 diabetes. So therefore, it should be healthy and balanced meals in the right quantity, ensuring that there is nutrient density. So it's not only about quantity, it's also about nutrient density, keeping cultural preferences and routine in mind. For example, if you have a South Indian plan, a South Indian diet, if you have a Gujarati patient, they love they are dhokla or the khandvi or the handwo. So try and keep it very, very specific to what they've been eating because then we will get more compliance. Now, when we come to fixed insulin doses or pre-mixed insulin doses, though we don't see this too much in our children today, they are on basal bolus regimes. But however, because of affordability or other reasons, if they are on a pre-mixed insulin dose or on fixed insulin dose, then synchronization of insulin action of, with food intake is very important. It is very important to keep consistency in timing of meals, consistency in amount of carbs eaten, and this will ensure good glycemic control and reduce risk of hypoglycemia. Now, why carb counting? Carbohydrates have the greatest short-term impact on your blood glucose levels. We all know that they're immediately converted to glucose within the first two hours of eating and have a direct influence on your post-meal blood glucose levels. Protein and fat take up to two to three hours to show up as blood glucose. And you may you will agree with me that our Indian home-cooked meals, they're not very high in protein and fat. So therefore, carbohydrate counting initially is what we educate our patients on. And then we step up to protein and fat counting, especially if they're eating from out or ordering in food from outside. 
the county carbohydrate servings provides an accurate guess of how the blood glucose will rise after a meal or snack now it is very very important that when sorry carbohydrate counting is the key to maintaining right control over blood glucose levels now this is something which uh, uh, you know even ispad guidelines very clearly stated that we should start carbohydrate counting at diagnosis because it's very difficult for them to learn and unlearn so start it at diagnosis in a very very simple manner recognition very important is to understand which are the foods which have carbohydrates which are the foods which do not have carbohydrates education on reading food labels because today a lot of children are eating out of packets whether though we do not encourage them but it's important to educate them about food labels use of scales and handy measures you know we ensure that every child who goes out of our clinic goes out with measuring cups and spoons so that you know they start from day one rather than them going out we really do not know if they're going to buy it so very simple you know you get these measuring cups at all shops and the food weighing scale to accurately estimate the kind of you know amount of carbs that they're eating for their portions use of resources today you have a lot of apps i've got this book on carb counting uh, which is referred to most of our patients even globally and practical advice about food away from home and use of carbohydrate counting now carbohydrates very very important which foods have got carbs because typically they think that milk has got only protein and they do not board is for milk or they would think that dal does not have uh, carbs you know they think dal is a protein food and often we will uh, see the children or the parents giving the children too much of dal maybe two three cups of dal to drink and then wonder why is the post meal blood glucose going high and therefore it's very important to educate you know them about which are the foods which contain carbs then this is another important thing which is sugar free products i know diwali is just gone and a lot of people eat sugar free and they think sugar free means carb free and calorie free and therefore they eat it excessive amounts and they do not realize that even if it is sugar free it does have got does have carbs and therefore your education about reading food labels is extremely important now what are the low carb and the no carb foods so all your non veg foods do not have carbs if you're eating an egg and these are good you know i i call them my arm and ammunitions to keep whenever the child is on a rapid acting insulin and wants to eat something in between then what does the mother give the child and these are the foods that can be given however it is very important to keep in mind that we choose low saturated fat options children feel very happy when you know we allow them to have cheese once in a way they love yogurt uh, nuts are good because we tell them to have a handful of nuts because it does it doesn't really impact their glucose levels even a glass of buttermilk is great eggs is always good but if they are eating eggs if they are vegetarian then we have paneer in limited amounts now insulin to carb ratio i've been hearing a lot of people discuss it so i'm not going to go into detail but we know the formula it's basically total daily dose one very important point that i want to make here is that only people who are on multiple daily insulin or on basal bolus regimen can do carbohydrate counting we cannot do carbohydrate counting in patients who are on pre mixed insulin because there if you increase the insulin not only the short acting but also the intermediate acting is increased therefore only those who are on basal bolus regime can do insulin to carb count uh, carb counting and we calculate the insulin to carb ratio for very young children who are needing less than 10 units of insulin a day 300 to 450 rule may be applicable but very important is this is just the starting point we have to work very closely with the patient we have to follow up with the child to see what is his or her insulin to a uh, carb ratio so therefore regular blood glucose testing is extremely important and today you have the cgms your vgps and there we can see what is the kind of impact however again very important is you know parents think that carbs are a villain and then they give less carbs because they think that i have to give less insulin and as a result of which even the amount of calories that they give the child is compromised the nutrients are compromised it's very important to tell them that they are growing children and they need adequate calories and nutrients for growth evaluation of insulin to carb ratio so whenever we have the child and we are starting them on to carb counting very important is to tell them to eat home cooked meals which are simple meals not like a pizza or a burger because that will be high in fat and it, we will not be able to estimate the insulin to carb ratio monitor the blood glucose every 2 to 4 hours add to us the post meal blood glucose minus the pre meal blood glucose should be between 30 to 60 mg per dl at for us the blood glucose should be back in the target range if it's back in the target range we know that the insulin to carb ratio is working fine for example master x consumed 60 g of carbohydrate the bolus given was 5 units because his icr is 1 is to 12 check glucose after 2 hours post meal glucose is within 30 mg per dl therefore you know that okay 1 is to 12 is correct 
However, it's very important to you know, educate our patients about insulin stacking because a lot of times they will eat meals in a period of two hours and again take more insulin. There, there is a fear of insulin stacking and hypoglycemia. Again, ICR can vary at different times of the day. And this is extremely important because the child may need more insulin in the morning because of dawn phenomena. And because the child is more active in the evening, may require lesser amount of insulin for the same amount of carbs. Now, if this child is on a, um, a pump, then you can set up to eight different insulin to carb ratios. So you can have a different insulin to carb ratio in the morning, a different one in the afternoon, and a different one in the evening. Now, very, very important is to rule out other factors which may influence blood glucose reading. One is weekday and weekends. Our children's recalls are very different on weekdays and weekends. Uh, weekdays, and again, in the insulin pump, you can set different patterns. You have a different pattern for a weekday, you have a different pattern for a weekend, or for holidays, like now the Diwali holidays are going on, sleep pattern. I think, again, with lockdown, our children are sleeping very late, and that can impact the glucose levels. Eating out versus eating home-cooked meals, physical activity. So if the child has been very active, and then suddenly there's exams, and he's not active, you will see the glucose levels going high. So we have to factor that in. Pubertal status, menstruation, examination, emotional and mental stress, illness, timing of insulin and meals, and high fat meals. So we have to ensure that we rule out all these factors to understand that the insulin to carb ratio that we've set is right, or we need to tweak it. And as I mentioned earlier, we have now a lot of devices and with advancement of technology, we have uh, CGMS, we have AGP, which actually gives us a good idea as to how the glucose levels are. Now, when we come to different types of insulin, like we say, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And I think Sir is here, and he will agree with me that in the past, we used to have, you know, dietitians and doctors giving out cyclostyle sheets of 1,200 calories, 1,400, 1,600, and 1,800. And it was the same diet that went out to all patients. But however, today, it's different. Every prescription calls for a different diet plan or a meal plan. We do not call it a diet plan. It's a meal plan. So... If the child is on a regular bolus with a basal analog or NPH, then because regular acting insulin works for a longer period of time and there's a peak at two to four hours, again, here we have to plan a mid-morning snack. So basically distribute the carbs at breakfast and mid-morning. If regular is given at lunch, distribute at lunch and evening and dinner and bedtime, especially if the child is taking an NPH before dinner because there is a risk of nocturnal hypoglycemia. Now, this is uh, another regime that most of our children could be on because they sleep early in the night. They sleep by around 9 o'clock. They have their dinner at 8. They, they are not awake to have that cup of milk or a bedtime snack in the night, and therefore they could be on regular in the morning, regular at lunch, and rapid acting at dinner. So here, you plan a mid-morning and a breakfast for the morning regular. You plan a lunch and an evening snack for the afternoon regular and for the rapid acting because the child is on a basal analog and not NPH then you just plan a dinner and this child does not need a bedtime snack. The last one is your rapid acting insulin three times a day. So if the child is on a rapid acting insulin three times a day because of the shorter duration of action the in-between snacks if the child wants to eat something in between we can give them low or no carb snacks. For example, we can give them a handful of nuts, we can give them buttermilk, maybe plain yogurt, a boiled egg, or just a salad. So these are your low carb or no carb option. However, if the child is going out or wants to eat a snack, we give the insulin as per the insulin to carb ratio. So we count the carbs, especially if they're going for a birthday party. We tell them to tell us what is available there. We help them count the carbs or we give them a guideline and then they take their insulin for the meal. Now, in an insulin pump, it's very easy to bolus. So you have the bolus wizard calculator. And I think it's very important that we educate all patients who have got the pump about the bolus wizard. We have sometimes patients coming to us who've been on a pump for five to six years, maybe sometimes 10 years, and they do not know about the bolus wizard. They're not using it. And therefore, it's very, very important to encourage them to use the bolus wizard because it really gives them good glycemic control. So... One is you can bolus it. So if you're eating a large apple, you feed in the amount of carbs and then it'll tell you depending on your insulin to carb ratio that you fed in, how much insulin that you need. Now we come to effect of protein and fat. Now protein or fat in moderate amounts added to a meal grants the post-meal blood glucose response. And we know, all, we know this and that is why we encourage patients to add protein and good quality fats to their meal so that they get a, you know, blunted post-meal blood glucose response. However, if eaten in large amounts, which is 
fat more than 20 grams and protein more than 20 to 25 to 30 grams, it can blunt or slow down the breakdown of carbohydrate from the meal, causing the blood glucose levels to rise much later. So in most individuals, it will be necessary to consider additional dosing for meals containing more than 20 grams of fat and 25 to 30 grams of protein. But as we mentioned, it's not a one size fits all. It's highly individualized. And here we will have to see what is this individual sensitivity for fat and protein, just like it is to carbohydrate. And this will be, we will be able to note this only when we do frequent blood glucose monitoring or CGMS and AGP in such situations is recommended. Now, for if you look at our Indian uh, children, you know, what would they eat? It'll be a burger or a pizza or uh, lollipops. And if they're going out, so a Mughlai meal, a Chinese meal, Italian meals, uh, these uh, pasta, because this is what children like to eat. If they're going for a birthday party, there'll be cake and there'll be muffins, pastries. All this will call for fat and protein counting. Now, what are the clinical guidelines? The American Diabetes Association 2018 guidelines very clearly have stated that once the child has mastered or the caregiver of the child has mastered the art of carb counting, we can then start educating them about fat and protein gram estimation. The ISPAD 2018 guidelines say that the impact of dietary fat and protein should be considered when determining the insulin bolus dose and delivery. Now, I, my friend Kamal Smart does, has done a lot of studies to see the impact of fat and protein, and she's in Australia. And when compared to a low-fat, low-protein meal, glucose excursions for a high-fat, high-protein meal significantly increase. And especially they've seen it post-300 minutes, they've seen that the mean glucose excursion for a high-fat, high-protein meal was 97 milligram per DL higher than the low-fat, low-protein meal. Now, we know that the high-fat, high-protein meal reduces early postprandial glucose excursions, but can cause late sustained hyperglycemia between 180 to 300 minutes. And adding protein or a, you know, to a carb-containing meal, like Anna said in during her discussion today, it may help to prevent late post-meal hypoglycemia. And this is very important, especially in activity days. And that's why she mentioned that we should encourage them to add protein to their carb meals. Now, when we come to only protein meals, so suppose you're eating only protein, then only when we eat protein to the tune of 75 grams to 100 grams, I'll tell you honestly, we really do not see children eating so much of protein at a time. It's more, I think, in the Western uh, countries where they would eat a large steak or eat something which is really, really high in protein, then it does have an impact equal to around 20 grams of carbs and needs additional bolusing and Again, very important is you need to give them an additional bolus. What are the ISPAD guidelines saying? It says that you start with very, very small doses. So you start with 15 to 20% for high fat, high protein meals. You start slow and then you gradually step up. Now, when we come to the insulin pump, you have three types of bolus options. So you can give your bolus in three different types. One is you have a normal bolus, for example, you're eating a sandwich or a simple Indian meal, which is got chapati, bhaji, dal, rice. Then you can give a normal bolus, which will deliver insulin all at once. However, if the person has got gastroparesis or is going to be grazing for a long period of time, you can actually extend the release of insulin. So the delivery of insulin can be given over a period of time. So this is called your square wave or extended bolus. Dual wave or combination bolus works well, especially when we're eating a high fat, high protein meal along with carbohydrate. So this is a combination of your normal bolus along with your square bolus. So you can give some amount of insulin upfront and then give a square bolus, which is going over a period of time. So this is the most commonly used insulin uh, bolus type, especially in our children when they're eating high fat, high protein meals. Now, whenever the child is eating a high fat or high protein meal, the recommendations are that you add 20 to 60% of the insulin to carb ratio. But like I mentioned, the guidelines very clearly state that you start very, very slowly and increase gradually. Recent data in children and adolescents using insulin pump therapy found a mean additional 30% of dose for very high protein meal and up to 60% more for a high fat, high protein meal that could be required. So start with the 20% more and then increase with the required. And very important is to do regular blood glucose monitoring. So at three hours, at five hours, seven to eight hours to ensure that there is no delayed hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. When we're looking at a dual wave bolus or a combination bolus, you give 60% of the insulin upfront. So you can set the insulin bolus to 60-40 and you can set it 
at 60% going upfront and 40% being squared over a period of two to three hours. So for high protein meals with carbohydrate, you can split it 60, 40 over two hours and high protein with high fat and carbohydrate, you split it 60, 40 split over three hours. And this is all from the studies that are done by Carmel Smart and team in Australia. Now, for example, if you look at our children, they eat pizza, which is high fat, high carb. So postprandial glycemia, we see up to four to five hours. So we see a delayed increase in the blood glucose. And similarly, we've seen with ice cream. Somebody had a question about ice cream. And we know that ice cream is a high fat food, which has also got sugar. So the, de the release of glucose is like, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is uh, releasing later. And therefore here, again, a dual wave bolus may come into the picture. So dual wave combination bolus, you can try 60, 40. If 60, 40, you think doesn't work, you can look at 70, 30, sometimes even 50, 50, split over three hours. Now, this is very, very interesting. A lot of children, you know, sometimes they want to eat cornflakes, they like the bread. So there is this concept of super bolus. And this can be used only by patients who are on the pump. So for example, if the child is on an insulin pump, you can withdraw the basil for two hours and then add that to your bolus dose. For example, if the child is having uh, taking four units of bolus and the basal is 0.5 units per hour, you can pull the 0.5 plus 0.5, which is one unit, and add that to your bolus and, you know, make the basal for the next two hours as zero. And this really works well for your high GI foods. So key take home message, type one diabetes management calls for a team approach. Very important as we work together as a team. So the patients, the caregivers, the doctor, the qualified dietitian, the educator, and the psychologist, every child is unique and the meal plan must be personalized at various stages, depending on the insulin regime, the routine, activity, social events, and growth phase. We want our children to lead a very normal life and not feel deprived. And we've been hearing this over the last three days that they can live a very, very normal and enjoy a, li a life living with type one diabetes. And Last but not the least, education from time of diagnosis on carb counting, stepping up to protein and fat counting with timely follow-up sessions have shown improvements in dietary freedom, glycemic control, and quality of life, particularly if delivered as a part of a structured educational package. So thank you so much for your patient hearing. I have a chapter on carb protein and fat counting in my book, Diet and Diabetes Simplified. So thank you so much.